Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we talk about issues affecting veterans after they get out of the military. Before we get started, I'd like to ask a favor. If you haven't done so already, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. If you've already done that, thank you. These ratings help the show get discovered so it can reach a wider audience. And while you're there, click the subscribe button so that you get notified of new episodes as soon as they come out. If you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can visit driveonpodcast.com forward slash subscribe to find other ways of subscribing, including our email list. I'm your host, Scott Deluzio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast. Today, my guest is Amanda Huffman. Amanda deployed to Afghanistan in 2010 as part of the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Kapisa Province. Amanda, I don't want to tell too much of your story right off the bat here, but welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sounds good. I'm Amanda, and I served in the Air Force for six years as a civil engineer, and I deployed with the Army on a Provincial Reconstruction Team. So I served in the Air Force, I say, for five years, and then I got to be in the Army for a year. And my husband and I met in college doing the Reserve Officer Training Corps program. So we were dual military the whole time that I was in. He was a year ahead of me, so we got married my senior year. And we were able to not ever PCS together. So when it was time for us to start our family, we decided it would put a lot more stability if one of us could stay home. And so I decided to leave the Air Force and be a stay-at-home mom and military spouse and follow his career around. And that's kind of where we are today, I guess. Should I talk about my podcast? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Through leaving the military, I started a blog called Airman to Mom because it was really hard for me to leave the military and to be a stay-at-home mom. So I started doing writing, which is kind of totally different than civil engineering. But it was really complicated because I knew we were going to move in a year when my husband, when I got out. So I didn't want to work as a civil engineer and then start over and work. And so I started doing like freelance work and writing. And then I started a podcast this past January, um, interviewing women who serve, served or are serving in the military. Awesome. Um, that is, that's actually really, really good. And, and time-wise, um, I, I started this podcast just a few months after uh, you started yours. So we're, we're probably in a similar spot in terms of the journey of, you know, starting a podcast and everything. So that that's uh, pretty interesting. And another uh, kind of interesting thing to me that we talked about a little bit before the um, uh, we started recording here, um, it, it was interesting to me and, and, um, and everything, uh, is that you deployed in 2010. That's also the time that, that I deployed to Afghanistan. Um, and you're, you're the second person that I've had on the show now who was in the same country um, at the same time who was not in my unit. So that was kind of interesting to me. Um, I know there's, like I said before, thousands of troops over there at the, the same time. So it's not much of a coincidence, but just still an interesting uh, little uh, coincidence to me. Right. Um, so you, you mentioned that you... Um, that you were a, um, a civil engineer and uh, you were part of the, uh, the provincial reconstruction team. Um, why don't you uh, start off by telling us a little bit about what that is for anyone who might not know uh, what that is. So the military started doing these teams and it started, I think, in Iraq where they would go out and they would meet with the local people and help them build uh, projects like roads, bridges, cons- uh, schools, government buildings, anything that the local people needed. And so when I got to Afghanistan, we had, I think, 26 projects ranging from roads, retaining walls, a lot of schools, and some government buildings. And we, Kapisa is about the size of Rhode Island, but because of the threat concerns, we could go to the northern part. Um, that was right by the FOB we were at, Forward Operating Base, but to go to, but there were no roads to get to the, like, most northern part, and then to get to the southern part, there was a road, but it wasn't safe, so we would go to Bagram a lot, so we'd go, we'd be on the FOB primarily, and then, like, at least once or twice a month, we'd go to Bagram, and then we'd run missions to the northern part of Kapisa, because there was a road to get there, 
and then we would go down to cobble and then come back up from the bottom and so oh, okay. we drove all over <laughs> the country <laughs> so you probably doing- got a good a good uh overview of what the that area looked like um you know on the on the ground and everything yeah. seeing all the the different you know maybe villages and things like that that were around that area so that, that's pretty cool um so i from reading on your your blog your website um uh i saw you mention uh something about a mission that you you had going out to a uh, school uh that was um that you guys were, were working on and, um, you know, you had, uh, you know, obviously a bit of a security team that was out there with you. Um, and then your, the group that you were with, uh, the, the people that you were with, um, started taking some enemy fire from, uh, you know, different directions and things like that. Um, uh, was this your first experience with enemy, uh, contact or was, was this something that happened fairly frequently? We didn't get attacked. We were with the French. So it was a French task force. And then we were the PRT, the American PRT. So they're, so the, the Afghans would go after the French because they were, they had different rules of engagement and it was easier for them to attack the French. And they're, they were still using those. I don't, they look like tanks and we had the MRAPs, which were much more intimidating. So most often they would attack the French and they would let us go by. And the, the, when they attacked us, they actually, we were outside the school and we were waiting to go in and waiting for the security team to clear it. And they were down in a ravine. And if they had just waited like five minutes, they would have had like clear shots at us because of the way we would have had to enter the school because the back door and we thought we were in a pretty safe place because we'd been there multiple times and never been attacked and so Mm -hmm. I feel like we were really protected because they could have easily had had a much better plan and even if they had let us get into the school we would have had to get out of the school and it would have been it would have been complete chaos but instead we just had a few people you had like three or four people inside and most of us were like halfway between so we were like 50 to 100 feet from the vehicles I guess we were more like a hundred, yeah, over a hundred feet from the vehicles, and we just had to run back to the trucks and get inside. Yeah, probably a hundred feet, but it probably felt like ten miles of you know <laughs> distance that you had to cover, yeah. you know, while you know enemies were were you know taking yeah. shots at you and, and things like that. That um, is yeah, it was never definitely unreal. Experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like everything um, goes in like slow motion. It was so yeah. Right. Yeah. No. That that's not an uncommon experience. I I think with with things like that um you know especially when when things are are happening all over the place you, you're not sure what's going on things just kind of s- seem to slow down anyways right um it may have only been you know 15 or 20 seconds but it may have seemed like an inter- like an eternity uh you know as as you're going through all of that um but once so uh, going back to your uh your blog post about this um so you get back to the truck and you have, you know, the, the gunners up in the, the turret who's, um, you know, doing what he, what, what he can up there to, um, to help out the people who are, you know, basically pinned down, stuck inside right. the, the school. Um, and so you're, you're handing up smoke grenades to the, the gunner to basically lay down a, you know, field of, you know, cover for them right. um, to be able to uh Get escape out of, out of the school and, and, and get back to the, the trucks. Um, so you said, and I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head here, you, you said that somebody was, was describing this like as a movie scene, kind of as, as yeah. out of the school. The, the senior, the senior ma- or the master sergeant I was with. So we had um, engineering assistants and he was in a, I was in an MATV, which is like four seats. And so I couldn't really see out the window. And I think I was on the, the side away from the school but he was in an MRAP and he could see out the back or side window and he was like it was like because they threw so much smoke <laughs> and it was like different colored and it was just like kind of crazy they were worried they they were joking that they were worried that the guys weren't going to be able to find their way through all the smoke to get out of the school <laughs> yeah it all worked out yeah well I mean it, fortunately they they all made it out um you know, relatively unharmed and, you know, everyone got back, um, you know, to, to the vehicles and, and were able to kind of escape out of there safely. So that's, that's always good. Um, now, uh, on the subject of schools, because I know we, we sort of um, 
brushed over the topic or over the fact that you were at a school at, at that point. But um, from my own personal experience being in Afghanistan, I know the kids over there really want to get to school. Like that's mm-hmm. a, like a big thing to them. I know when, when we'd go out on, on missions, they'd always run up to us and, and ask, Mr. Mr. Give me a pen or, you know, <laughs> something like that. They need a pen to, to yes. write with because they have nothing, um, you know, over there to, to do their schoolwork with. And so, you know, every once in a while, you know, if we had an extra pen or something, we'd hand it out. And, and it was like, a swarm of kids would come out of nowhere. Like you might see like two or three kids, but then all of a sudden 50 kids are jumping over this one pen and it's crazy. Um, we actually had a situation where we were searching a truck on the side of a road for explosives. We thought there were, there were some explosives in it. And, um, we, so we stopped the traffic around that area. Like no one was able to come like, you know, whatever direction East and West, uh, on that road. And there were still kids trying to get past us past where we were going trying to get to school um and when when we told them that they couldn't continue going because they might get blown up they didn't really care <laughs> um they, they actually seemed like they were pissed at us for for stopping us from or stopping them from getting to school um i mean kids here <laughs> kids here fake being sick so that they don't have to go to school and kids over there are willing to get up, get blown up over the opportunity to get to school. Um, did you happen to notice anything similar to that while you were over there? Yes. The kids always were around us. Uh, the school that we were building that we got attacked at was actually a girl's school. So that school never had anybody at it. And it was kind of in a, we were in the line of like the Tajik and the Pashtun type of people groups. And so we, it was kind of a girl's school built in a place that didn't make sense because girls weren't allowed to go to school. And so that school never had any kids at it, but we had a few schools in the Northern section. And they, when we were building one of the schools, they were down on the side of the hill and the teacher was having class and they would like sit under a tree and they would be learning. And like even before the classrooms were officially done, but they had the chalkboards in them, we would find that they had come in and used the chalkboards when we weren't there um, because yeah, they wanted to learn and like, right. but it was always like, you always just saw boys. You rarely ever saw little girls. Yeah, that's that's another difference, uh, you know, culture wise that, that you don't, you don't really think about too much, um, you know, if you haven't experienced it, is that the the girls are, uh, and females in general, are, are treated as second-class citizens over there, um, like, like almost as if they they don't really matter. And, you know, that's, that's clearly not true, but it's just the way of life over there, um, which is unfortunate, but you know, it's, uh, that's just the way, um, the, the things are, uh, kind of, kind of over there. Um, but it's, I think it's also important, like through podcasts like this books and other, other things like that to shed light on some of that, that situation so that people who haven't been there, haven't had that experience, like kind of understand what right. uh, is going on. So I'm, I'm glad, um, you brought that up in terms of, you know, it, it was primarily boys, uh, there. Um, it's kind of jumping around a, a little bit here, but I, you know, I, I really enjoyed reading your, your website with all of the information that you had, uh, you know, about your, your deployment. Um, and in, in another blog post that you wrote about, uh, a time where you were flying in a helicopter, um, from your fob to, yeah. uh, to Bagram, uh, and you described it as a, oh, a beautiful Af- Afghanistan, um, and I, I've flown on many helicopters ar- around the country and, uh, uh, they were mostly at night, but some during the day. And, and you are right. The, the view from the sky is, um, uh, you know, of the country is actually pretty beautiful. Like uh, there's, you know, between the mountains and the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all the different, you know, landscapes and things like that around, it's actually pretty uh, uh, beautiful. Um, would you be able to describe kind of like that, uh, you know, what would you say it, it was most, um, you know, closest to in terms of like flying over, um, uh, or would you be able to describe the country in general? I mean, it's really mountainous and just so green and lush and there's a bunch of farming and it was really cool to see because you could see like the house walls when we would drive around, but you could like see into the little encampments and see like how it was broken out. Right. And it was just so neat to see like all the projects because we had a road that we were 
working on. And so we got to see the road that we were helping build from the sky and like the whole thing and like under the bridges and over the bridges and like it was on the side of a cliff. So th then the mountains, it was, I'm trying to think of like, it was a lot like where I was current, I was stationed in New Mexico and it was like at the base of the Rockies and it was mm -hmm. kind of like that. Right. It was just, but grander not because it was the base of the Rockies it wasn't like you know but it was like there were no people and so it was just like open space and it was really pretty and right yeah yeah, yeah I, I live uh right now I live in Arizona and there's some mountains around us that very much remind me of where I was in Afghanistan um and we actually had a very different uh kind of landscape it was mountainous but you said there's like lots of trees and farming and things like that we had I think we had one tree and I don't know how it grew because it like didn't there's no water nearby I don't know how it grew um but we had a tree <laughs> that yeah. was nearby um uh so you also wrote uh, about an, an earthquake that you experienced oh, yeah. when you were when you were over there and now this wasn't it didn't turn out to be a super major incident um but this is actually more for my own uh, curiosity do you remember when like about when during the, the time uh, that was uh, it was over halfway, so I think it would be like in the late summer or early okay. fall. And okay, yeah, I I'm, I'm right through it. <laughs> yeah, I'm only asking because I know I was there during an earthquake, but I I don't remember it like at all. And I was only reminded of it a, a couple months ago that that someone said, "Oh yeah, did, you know, remember about that time that the that earthquake happened?" And I, like to be honest, I don't remember at all. I, I don't know if I, I slept through it too. And I just, it was a non event yeah. to me and someone told me about it or something like that or, or, or whatever. Um, for us, anyways, it was that, a big deal. Cause up in the mountains where they were building a road, they had made all this progress on the road. And then like, I think it rained at the same time that the uh, earthquake happened and the way that the, like the earthquake happened and the way the like floodwaters came, it like took out like a huge, I was like, we stopped and I was like, why are we stopping? We can keep going. And they were like, no, you need to get out of the truck. And I was like, okay. So I like got out to the truck and there was this huge like washout from like where they hadn't built a retaining wall like they were supposed to. And the river just ate the whole road away. And it was like over a mile from where they had finished. And there was just this huge gaping, wow. oops, sorry, a huge gaping hole. And it was just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we we actually had so the rains um, that you're you're t talking about. We had an incident where our um, our platoon was on uh, QRF, the Quick Reaction Force, uh, for um, you know for our our uh, company, and we had a a group of Afghans who came to our gate asking for our help uh, after one of the like real real heavy rains that they mm -hmm. get uh, you know during the summer, and. Apparently, they were like this group of nomadic people. They they didn't really have homes. They just kind of lived in tents and they traveled all around and, and things like that. But they had lots of cows with them. And a big flash flood came through and washed right right in between like where they were and where the cows were. And the, the cows were stuck on this little, little teeny sliver of high ground with the water rushing all around them. And they asked us to go out and like help save them. And so, like, we went out, we checked out, like, the area, but it was so far between, like, where, like, it was safe on the shore for, for us to be and to where the, the cows were, there was no way we were going to be able to help them. Like, we didn't know what to do. So, like, we ultimately, we ended up not helping them. Um, but, like, the rains, like, every, people might think of the country as being, like, a dry, arid, desert, right. you know, type place, but they do get an awful lot of rain, Um especially during the summer uh, months, um, which is, which is also interesting, uh, to, to think about, you know, when, when people haven't been there, they don't really know what to, to expect with that. Um, right. Now you also talked about a, uh, a mission that you went on to a, a woman's shelter, uh, in, uh, the, the capital city of the yeah. province you were in. I, I forget the name of the, the capital city. Mamu Raki. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what was, what was that like? What was that uh, mission to that woman's shelter like? So we met with like 
the women's leader. I don't remember what she was, but she was like in charge of like women. Oh, she was in charge of women's affairs in uh, Capisa. And so she had, I think there were like five or six women and they had been doing a bunch of like crafting and stuff. But what was most interesting was when we talked to the women, they were like huddled in the corner and they were like terrified of us. And so, like, I took my helmet off so it wouldn't be as terrifying, but I don't think sure. that really helped. But they all were running away from their husbands who were addicted to drugs. And they told us how they wanted to be with their husbands, but their husbands were, like, not safe to be around. Mm -hmm. But they felt, like, an obligation to go back to, like, help their families, but they also feared for their life. So they were in, like, a really tough situation, and it was really hard to, like, not be able to do anything to help them and so it was kind of just eye-opening to see like not only are like the women are treated not the same way American women are treated and they're treated like second-class citizens but then they also they have this like hard life of like being married to someone that they probably didn't even get to choose to be married to and then they're addicted to drugs and they have like no rights and they're just fleeing for their lives to come to that shelter and so right. it's just was eye-opening to hear like their stories and how hard their lives were yeah and that's definitely not an easy life uh, to have and and the the drugs um that are over there are fairly readily available because mm -hmm. a lot of the the farmers like you, you said there's a lot of farming that go on there that goes on there um and a lot of them are are growing the basically growing the drugs on their farms Right. Um, and because they make money, yeah, they 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 do make money, and unfortunately, that's what you know funds the the, the terrorist activities mm -hmm. that that go on over there because they can make a heck of a lot more money with uh, opium than they can with corn, corn. or you yeah. know <laughs> whatever. Um, so that's True. that's the, like super uh, common over there is you know a lot of people who are on on the drugs, um, and and the other thing I, that I heard, and I don't know the the truth behind this, um, but it was also that sometimes food is hard to come by and uh, some of those drugs are act sort of like a, a appetite suppressant. And so it, it makes it easier for them to deal with not having the food though, if they take the drugs, which doesn't really help anything, but it right. is what it is. So, um, and then uh, the other thing that I found interesting was they uh, at that women's shelter, they had a problem with their generator yeah. um, and Again, another, I guess, another cultural difference was their solution to the generator or, you know, the fuel that they were using for the generator. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? So we had been in Afghanistan long enough to know that we needed to, like, ask questions and not just be like, okay, we'll get you a new generator. So she told us the generator wasn't working. And so we were like, okay, well, what did you put in the generator as fuel? And she said, water. And we we're like, that's not fuel <laughs> so we were so we were kind of like we can't give you a new generator because obviously you can't afford gasoline because you're putting water in it but it was just like one of those things where they were like but it's a generator and it needs liquid and it's like but it needs a certain type of liquid but they didn't have that type of they didn't have electricity really so they didn't know how to work a generator and that was one of the hard parts about being a prt is because they were living in mud huts, like literal mud huts, not even mm -hmm. like that's what they lived in. And then we were building these like two story concrete schoolhouses because that's what the capital was telling us we had to have them do. And it was like it would have made more sense to just build them like a bunch of little mud huts because they didn't understand sustainment and they didn't understand like it's a building. Yes, but you have to take care of it. And they didn't even know how to fix it because they never had a concrete building. They knew how to take care of their mud huts, but they didn't know how to take care of a concrete building. They didn't know how to take care of a well. They didn't know how to take care of generators. So like all the stuff that we were building was kind of falling in disrepair because they didn't know how to maintain it. And they were very grateful for it, but they didn't understand sustainment. And so we were using those words of like, and just like, it's you have to take care of it and they're like no it's a building and we're like no it is a building but you still have to take care of it and you have to do like different things and so that was like a really big challenge of like the disconnect between the two cultures where we were kind of we weren't the capital in Kabul was pushing 
these American things that didn't really make sense in like rural Afghanistan. Yeah, and it almost seems like the time would have been better spent, uh, not not to take anything away from what you and other people, you know, who were over there, uh, you know, doing that, or even people who might still be there doing doing the type of work that you're doing, not to take anything away from that, but it almost seems like education might have been a better uh, goal, like teaching them how to build the buildings, right. how to maintain the buildings, how to... Um, you know, get electricity from one place to another, um, how generators work, you know, basic right. things, things that I, I say basic, but things that we take for granted as being basic. Like if I need a building to be built, I know I can go find a, uh, you know, a construction company with experts who can build this thing and, and take care of that right. because we live in a place where that's readily available. Whereas they, probably have very few people who know how to do this and in a country as big as as that if there's only a handful of people who can actually do the work or or even supervise the work you know um that it's probably a very hard thing to do so the education right. aspect the same way uh you know some some units trained the afghan army how to exactly. fight their own wars <laughs> is kind of like what we maybe needed to do with the, um, you know, the civil engineer side, the, um, right. you know, constructing buildings and roads and, and things like that. That's. Yeah. They had us read uh, three cups of tea before we left. And I was like, did you read it? Cause you're asking us to do stuff that he tells us not to do. <laughs> and so it was really, like you said, it was really frustrating because we were like, we wouldn't build any new projects. They, the leadership not our commander, but like the Bagram people were like, why aren't you building more projects? And we're like, they don't even need what we're doing. Like we need to figure out what they, and we need to talk about sustainment. And so we were kind of on that track of like, we're not going to build it unless you have a sustainment plan, but they didn't even understand what the word sustainment meant. So we spent like the whole nine months trying to explain what that meant. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it definitely could be very frustrating to, talk to somebody who is just not even on the same, they're not even in the same book, never mind the same page mm -hmm. as, as where you are. And, um, you know, we experienced that. We did some training with the, the Afghan army, um, getting them to, uh, you know, learn just basic infantry tactic, ta tactics uh, to get them to do, um, you know, some of their own patrolling and things like that. And we would go out with them on, on patrols, but, like just getting them to clean their weapons was like, well, why do I need to do that? The, the weapon's going to shoot because I'd pull the trigger and it should just, just work. Um, but then come to find out they never clean their weapons and we're actually in a firefight and they're like pointing at their weapon. Like it's not shooting. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I mean, we told you what to do and you just chose not to do it. So, right. you know, all the education in the world doesn't matter if they're not willing to put in the work, I guess. Um, it's sort of a Well, it's just a huge story. culture shift because like you yeah. handed them a rifle and they're like, oh, this will last forever. And it's like, no, I clean it every week and I have to take care of it. And they yeah. just couldn't. It was like it was a jump that we weren't trained to teach them. So we didn't we're doing our best and we're like, you just do it. Because you do right. it. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, they're, it's a def, definitely a different mindset. And, um, you know, especially when it comes to, um, you know, from my experience, when it comes to getting them to put in the, the effort, um, you know, like we, we would train them and like maybe a half hour, 45 minutes later, they'd be like, okay, we're done for the day. We're going to take a break. And it's like, well, like we barely scratch the surface on what we're trying to teach you. And <clears throat> I don't know how much of that actually stuck, but right. if anything, um, well, so speaking of cultural differences, um, which even as a, a male, uh, you know, being in Afghanistan, I noticed quite a bit of cultural differences over there. Um, and from a female's perspective, uh, what was it like for you being over there? Were you treated differently? Were you, um, uh, what was it like for you? So I had the advantage of having an engineering degree, which an engineering degree in Afghanistan is kind of like the way Americans think of doctors. And so they 
looked past the fact that I was a female because I had an engineering degree. And so when I dealt with like at the meetings, and I also was lucky because I was deployed with another female civil engineer. So the only engineers they could talk to were two women. And so I think it would be interesting if it had been a male and a female, if they would have been more directed towards him. But since it was two women and they knew like if they wanted money, they had to talk to us. So they, they didn't, they kind of looked at us as like, a, someone said they would kind of look at us like a third sex. Like we're not women. We're like American women, which are different than like their women. That was the right. way someone. And when we had gone to training, someone had told us to wear the like head coverings. But when we got in country, the civil engineers before us were like, no, I know you're trying to be respectful to the, of their culture, but if you wear the head coverings, they're going to see you as a woman, an Afghan woman, and not as an American woman. So you shouldn't wear the head coverings because that would actually like detriment you instead of like help you. And so, and it wouldn't have really helped anyways, because I would have had my helmet on and like a head covering. It would just look kind of funny anyways. But right. I think those, the two civil engineers before us gave us really good advice. Like, no, just look at them like they're equals and treat them the way you would treat a male. And so we kind of, we took their advice more than the people who had trained us back home about how to deal with, and we didn't have any problems. So, I mean, the local engineers we worked with, we had two local national engineers who would come on the base and they helped us go to site visits and do more thorough inspections. And one of them was always telling, because in Afghan culture, you have to get pregnant within the first year of being married. They have birth control, but they don't use it because you have to prove to whoever that you, well, and it's always the wife's fault if you can't get pregnant. It's never the man's. So sure. they, I was married and so was the, the other civil engineer and we both didn't have children. And so they were like, you guys are broken. <laughs> and we were like, and the one engineer, like, he kind of got more, like, the culture of the Americans. He was, like, more, he understood it better, but the other one, like, couldn't get past it. And so he would be like, shh, don't say that. Like, they're not broken. And so it was really funny because we just thought it was kind of interesting how, like, he couldn't wrap his mind around. Because we tried to explain. We're like, but we have birth control. And they're like, we have birth control, too, but we don't use it until after you have a baby. And so it was just interesting how the culture was different in that aspect. But that right. was, like, it, the worst of it. Yeah. Well, I, and that's, I suppose, that that is fortunate that that was the worst of it, you know, and, yeah. and it didn't get past anything else, you know, um, where they, they are just outright ignored you or yeah. you know, dis complete disrespect or whatever not that no they, they were, were super respectful but it, it was um you know a little bit different in that that respect yeah. i guess and a lot of the contractors you were talking earlier about like having people who could like do the building and all that the, a lot of the contractors were not actually afghans or if they were they had left afghanistan and they had come back and they wanted to like help their country. So like a lot of the expertise and like the people who were in charge were more, I guess, worldly because they had either been outside the country yeah. or they were from a different country. And so I think that helped a lot too. That's an interesting uh, thing that, you know, the, the people who have gotten out, you know, maybe they got an education someplace else, you know, wherever, whatever other country they, they went to, but then they decided to come back because they wanted to help their country. Mm -hmm. um, I know from my own experience, several people, um, and I'm just kind of being careful of who, I, you know, how I'm wording all of this, who, who left and have not, who are now doing things um, to help their, their country. Um, they, they came to the United States and now they're, they've, they've either gone back or they're, they're doing other things that are ultimately going to, to help their country. And so that's, um, you know, interesting that, um, you, you had those kind of engineering, uh, you know, people with the engineering backgrounds that, that were able to, uh, return to their country and, and mm -hmm. make a positive impact, um, you know, on, on their country. Um, you know, hopefully they can, help with the education of, you know, the rest of their, uh, you know, the people in the country so that they don't, 
you know, think that buildings just magically, you know, maintain right. themselves or whatever, but um, that's, I, I suppose, baby steps and they'll, they'll get there eventually. But um, what were some of the other uh, challenges that the, uh, your, the PRT had while you were working over there? Uh, were there any other like major, major issues outside of like, you know, the, the education issue and, and things like that? So we had a lot of like team dynamics that were really difficult. We were not like a unit that went overseas. We were like a mishmash of a bunch of different, we were Air Force, we were Army, we were active duty, we were reserves, we were National Guard. And so, and then we had some civilians and then we had people who were not even part of the PRT, but were on the FOB doing different things and there were some people who caused a lot of like disruptive behaviors and told lies about people and spread rumors and that part of the deployment was probably the most challenging part because of how our trust was betrayed and like some of the things that was said about me and the other female that were not true and how it just kind of like made it hard to be there when it was already hard to be there. Yeah, that it's like you're you're all already in a you know combat zone. You know, there's already stuff going on that's you know out of your control. It's hard enough mm-hmm. as it is. You don't need to be you know knocking each other down. It should, should be working together as a team to you know further you know whatever the mission is. Right. Um, uh, and so you briefly mentioned uh, earlier. I, I notice we're we're kind of coming up on time here, but I, I do want to get a chance to. Uh, you know, kind of go over your, uh, a couple other things here. You briefly mentioned that you, uh, had a podcast and, um, and I believe a book as well. Is that, that correct? Uh, that is, is, there... that is true. Okay. Yes. Um, and so why don't you, uh, tell us a little bit about those, you know, give, give a, a little, little plug for those. And, um, you know, if there's other, um, other things that you want to talk, I know you briefly mentioned the podcast before with, if there's other stuff you want to talk about that or, or the book, and uh, I'll be sure to include, you know, links to all this stuff in the, the show notes as well. So the book and the podcast are both called women of the military. That's my engineer coming out and my lack of creativity. But um, I started, I started a series and I did deployment stories and I ended up getting mostly women to respond to it. And so I was so fascinated by their stories that I wanted to hear more. So I dropped the word deployment and replaced it with women. And I started collecting stories of women and their experiences. And that's what the book turned into. I was going to do a blog series, but then I decided to put it on Amazon and make it into a book. So I have 28 stories of women from the Vietnam area up to present day sharing their experience. And a lot of them are anonymous. So it's kind of cool to hear like, actually what they're feeling and like all the good and the bad and then I started my podcast in January because someone suggested it would be a good idea and people were really excited and so I thought I was going to use the stories of the women who I had written back and forth with to create the the book but they ended up liked having their stories anonymous and they didn't really want to be on a podcast platform so I started reaching out to more women and now I've done a lot of interviews so I've just did my 47th episode this week and I I even got a chance to interview the 23rd secretary of the air force which is really cool yeah she's she's like she's a civilian she doesn't have any military background but she had such an interesting perspective of being a woman in charge of the civilian you know instead in charge of the air force as a civilian and being a woman and so it was just a really interesting story but i've had yeah so i've just had a chance to interview women about their experience and they share the good the bad i've had a few Um, military sexual trauma survivors share their story and so it's been a really healing place to hear the stories of women and for me as a female veteran I haven't had a chance to talk to a lot of women veterans because I kind of stepped back and got really involved in the like military spouse space and being a mom and so this has been slowly bringing me back to the veteran community which has been really neat. Well that's awesome and I I think uh, you know, what you're doing, you know, for the, the female veterans who are, uh, you know, being interviewed on, on your, your show and, and 
have their stories told in your book. Um, I think that is uh, really wonderful. And, um, you know, I'm, I'll be more than happy to, to share all of that uh, information to, to get hopefully more listeners and more readers, yeah. uh, more, more ears and eyeballs on all of your work. Um, where can people go to find out a little bit more about you and, and your book and podcast and, and things like that? So everything is on airmantomom.com right now. And I'm working to build a Women of the Military website because the podcast is kind of taking off more than my blog ever did, but it's not there yet. Um, so, but the podcast, there's a link to the podcast, a link to the book and a link to like all the blog posts. Like you read a lot of my deployment letters, which were letters I emailed home while I was deployed and then I converted them into blog posts. So you can read all that on airmantomom.com. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Amanda, for uh, joining me on the show and uh, telling your story about, you know, your time in, in Afghanistan and, uh, and sharing, you know, your book and your podcast and everything like that too. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun to talk about Afghanistan. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, driveonpodcast.com, or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Drive On Podcast. 